So let me just say a little bit about my mom. My mom was a dietitian in New York. She worked at a hospital and she was in charge. She was a supervisor, always telling people what to do. And she still tells people what to do even today. It wasn't until I would say 2000 and maybe uh, 12 that we realized something, the things just wasn't adding up. So at this point we had just stopped mom from driving because she was just having too many little incidents not not accidents, but just little incidents, you know, with the with, with her driving skills and and not really know how to navigate like she was comfortable in doing so. What happens in Alzheimer's disease is people are unable to encode or make new memories, um, and that gets worse over time. And that can be really tough on families when memories recede, so that people don't actually recall their children or recognize their children who are often caring for them. So, you know, this is why I, I tell my children, my family, our parishioners, you know, write it down. Just, just write it down. All of the precious memories that we have and, and seeing my grandson coming in, he put on a tie and a vest thinking he's going to be on a film. And, and, you know, those are just precious moments. I don't want to forget those. I don't want, I don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget those, those moments, but I say that in all sincerity of heart that I have had the best, have, still have, the best mom any girl could ever, ever, ever want to have. You know what I find um, to be probably the, one of the most amazing things is that <clears throat> when I actually, the day, I still can remember the day that I realized something just wasn't right with my mom. She um, had went to a gas station and she had to in, get someone to help her with pumping her gas. And so she came back home and said, I had to get somebody to help pump my gas. And I said, what? She said, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. So I didn't really think a whole lot of it at that time, but as time went on, other things began to happen. Hello? Hello? No, no, yeah, yes, he was. I think he got one out there. Then he got that flag, he'll get somebody. I said, don't bring your ass to my house. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say a little bit about my mom. My mom was a dietitian in New York. She worked at a hospital and she was in charge. She was a supervisor, always telling people what to do. And she still tells people what to do even today. It wasn't until I would say 2000 and maybe uh, 12 that we realized something, the things just wasn't adding up. So at this point we had just stopped mom from driving because she was just having too many little incidents not, not accidents, but just little incidents, you know, with, the, with, with her driving skills and, and not really know how to navigate like she was comfortable in doing so. What happens in Alzheimer's disease is people are unable to encode or make new memories, um, and that gets worse over time. And that can be really tough on families when memories recede so that people don't actually recall their children or recognize their children who are often caring for them. So, you know, this is why I, I tell my children, my family, our parishioners, you know, write it down. Just, just write it down. All of the precious memories that we have and, and seeing my grandson coming in, he put on a tie and a vest thinking he's going to be on a film. And, and, you know, those are just precious moments. I don't want to forget those. I don't want, I don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget those, those moments, but I say that in all sincerity of heart that I have had the best, have, still have, the best mom any girl could ever, ever, ever want to have.
You know what I find um, to be probably the, one of the most amazing things is that <clears throat> when I actually, the day, I still can remember the day that I realized something just wasn't right with my mom. She um, had went to a gas station and she had to in, get someone to help her with pumping her gas. And so she came back home and said, I had to get somebody to help pump my gas. And I said, what? She said. You know what I find um, to be probably the, one of the most amazing things is that <clears throat> when I actually Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. And this is our final More Than the Score lecture for the season. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, you know, when we start the season each year, we, um, we plan great lectures and we hope folks will show up. So we're always pleased when you do. So thank you for being here. And a warm welcome to our at home uh, audience as well. We had over a thousand people registered for the online uh, talk this morning. So thank you. <clears throat> We have tons of programs this spring, uh, so feel free to visit our website and uh, register and share it with friends. Uh, visit us at engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Um, and we plan the More Than Score programs with the Alumni Association. They're our partner for this program, and we thank uh, both of our teams for working, the Lifetime Learning Team, the Office of Engagement Team, and the Alumni Association association team for working the entire fall every Saturday morning for a more than a score talk so thank you for being for being there uh, staff um, okay uh, we will have questions at the end so please hold your questions we got in over a hundred questions from you uh, so I know that this is an important topic for our community um, but please hold your, your question to the end and our panel will try to answer as many of them as possible. And they've woven in quite a few of your questions into the presentation as, as well. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome this uh, panel of experts this morning to talk about Alzheimer's disease, research, caregiving, and community. And Ashan, uh, Ashan Williams, Carol Manning, and George Bloom uh, will be sharing with us this morning. George Bloom, um, he and I were up here um, having a conversation. I think this is his third or fourth talk for the More Than a Score uh, group. <laughs> Absolutely. So how many of you um, have been impacted or know someone um, in fact affected by this disease? Wow. Wow, the entire audience. Um, me too, I, I admit it. Uh, my mom currently has this disease, so it's very personal to me. Uh, so I, I look forward to learning right alongside you. All right, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the morning. Ishan Williams is the associate professor at the University of Virginia School of Nursing. Her background and PhD are in human development and family studies. Professor Williams completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Institute on Aging at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Focus on recruitment and health care inequities among older adults and family caregivers. Her current research focuses on the quality of life among older adults with dementia and their family caregivers. Also, she focuses on chronic disease management for older adults with type 2 diabetes and culturally appropriate uh, community-based interventions among African-American adults. Professor Williams' research further concentrates on understanding the healthcare needs um, 
of older adults and their family caregivers within social, cultural, and geographical contexts. Her research has been widely published in various peer review journals. Uh, so Professor Williams, thank you for being here. Thank you for assembling this panel, and we look forward to learning from you. This is also Alzheimer's Awareness Month, so thank you, panel. Please go ahead and give them a warm more than a score welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Althea. It is so nice to be with you all this morning. Um, it's a lovely day outside, so I'm actually counted a privilege that you came inside for a little while just to hear this talk. So um, welcome to all of you, and thank you to my um, colleagues who, who decided to join me today. I'm gonna um, first start with, okay, we, oh, yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's okay. They're gonna get us back to the, to the beginning of uh, the slides, but as you were coming in, you should have noticed the video that was being played. Um, and Ms. Cooper and her husband are joining us today. She's the one featured as the caregiver in that film. And it was a, a partnership that my colleagues, Dr. George Bloom and Dr. Van Horn, who's not able to be here with us today, put together to really try to bridge together sort of the, the biology of Alzheimer's disease, our community, and the care partners or caregivers that often have the brunt or pay, take the brunt of caring for someone living with Alzheimer's disease. And so we wanted to kind of start or situate the context of how um, we talk about Alzheimer's disease today and we titled our, our presentation, Alzheimer's Disease Research, Caregiving and Community because as a team approach at University of Virginia and our member and aging care center and the Virginia Alzheimer's Disease Center, we really do see this as a, a, a tripod of working together with individuals, with their families and with our clinicians. And so um, hopefully if you want to see the rest of that film, it's really short. We only showed a three minute clip. It's at the Alzheimer's, it's at animatingalzheimers.org uh, or com. It's in here, but uh, it's one of the, if you put in animating Alzheimer's, it'll come up, no apostrophe, because um, I really think it would, you would enjoy the, um, and it's only about 15 minutes, so um, please go see that. My other colleagues, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them briefly, um, because as I finish my talk, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Um, Bloom, and he is a professor of biology, cell biology and neuroscience at the University of Virginia here, where he also has served as the chair of the Department of Biology from 2017 to 2020. Um, next to him, you have Dr. Carol Manning. She is a di the director of the Memory Disorders Clinic here at UVA and the co-director of our Virginia Alzheimer's Disease um, Center. She's also the Harrison Distinguished Teaching Professor of Neurology, the Director of the Neurobehavioral Assessment Laboratory, and the Associate Chair for Faculty Development in the Department of Neurology here at the University of Virginia. So again, I thank them for being here because as you see all those titles, they are very busy people. All right, I'm going to keep this. And voila. Woo I'm going to do a magnet shirt today. It's going to work in just one second. I don't <laughs> How many times can you do it? It's three for the genie, right? Like it's three. Okay. Okay. Nope. Okay, maybe that worked. Okay. That's what I just talked about. <clears throat> All right, so I don't, I think the audience, as I saw so many hands go up, um, this is not an unknown statistic. One in three seniors will pass away with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. And I just wanted to put this here to start the conversation about the known risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And as you see this list here, you see that age is the most, um, most people who develop the disease are over the age of 65, but we are seeing younger people developing the, the disease. But also another strong risk factor is family history. Those who have a parent, a brother, or sister with Alzheimer's disease are also likely to develop the disease. Um, also, I think it's important to mention the heart health head to heart connection. Some of the strongest evidence that we have in research today links the brain health to heart health. This connection makes sense because the brain is nourished by one of the body's richest networks of blood vessels, and the heart is responsible for pumping blood vessels um, to the brain. So we can see that when you hear people say, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, that is why. So always think about the ways that you can increase your heart health. 
Here, I just, in addition to the risk factors that were listed on the previous slide, we can also talk about the risk factors that tend to be more represented among populations who have been often marginalized, marginalized in our society or under-resourced for different reasons, whether it be race, ethnicity, wealth and poverty um, inequalities, housing inequalities, access to care, and poorly managed health care. And here are just a list of these things, because as you look at this list of risk factors, you can kind of see which ones are modifiable and those that are sort of you're, you're born with, those are things that you can't change. But there are several modifiable factors here. Here I want to just amplify again that in addition to the main risk factors of the general population, um, Hispanic adults, African American adults, and women are at the highest risk for Alzheimer's disease. Research shows that Hispanics are about, Hispanic adults are about one and a half times more likely than white adults to develop Alzheimer's and other dementias, while older African American and black adults are twice as likely to develop the disease. The reasons for these differences are not, clear, not, are not completely clear or well understood, but researchers do believe that the higher rates of vascular disease in these groups may also put them at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Yet, in these groups of um, po minoritized populations, they're also less likely to receive a diagnosis, so less likely to go into treatment earlier in the disease progress, which then puts greater um, burden on those families. So at the Virginia Alzheimer's Disease Center, we have two key focus areas that we try to, to um, focus on with our um, research in dementia. What I want to highlight here is because of the growing um, demographic is changing in our population, older adults from populations of color are the fastest growing group. And as you saw on the previous slides, they, they um, suffer from disproportionate rates of Alzheimer's disease. In 2020, individuals over the age of 85 will represent 19, they represented 19% 19 of our older adult population. By 2050, populations of color will increase to surpass the non-Hispanic white population, which has significant implications for how we're going to meet health care needs. So one of the things that we try to propose is that when we develop interventions around Alzheimer's disease and even our clinical trials, if we try to reach those who are the most under-resourced and the most vulnerable, then we're going to benefit all, everybody. The most inclusive interventions actually support the health care system to, to support everyone living with the disease. <clears throat> Another key area that we focus on at um, here, because as you know, Charlottesville is this little little dot on the map, and everything around us is pretty rural in the um, state of Virginia it, until you get further east. Um, this um, rural dwelling adults account for about 20% of the population. They also suffer disproportionately worse health outcomes. Um, compare with the rest of the nation. And these include things like they have higher rates of breast cancer, higher rates of prostate, colorectal cancer, and of course, Alzheimer's disease. This is incredibly important because there are certain barriers that are related to being living in a rural residence. Geographical region has a, um, is you see more delayed detection. As I said, with other under-resourced populations, they have less resources to actually see specialists to get diagnoses early in the process. So again, mm -hmm. another population that we want to pay close attention to. Um, just to reiterate, they also underutilize our healthcare and medical social services because they have less access to them. Um, and they also face difficulties in actually going through the cognitive evaluations because in most of our rural communities, we have primary care practices which may not be equipped with some of the neurological, full neurological assessments that we can kind of, like what we do here at, in, um, at UVA. Okay. So why is this significant? Um, historically, you know, we have seen that research is clear that being stigmatized, regardless if it's because of your memory, because of cognition, because of other mental health conditions, race, or where you live, these things have all been associated with poorly managed health care. And um, this is why we need to have and talk more about, in terms of research community and our older adults living with this, we need to talk about how trust and communication between your healthcare team, between your family members, about how to be more at, um, empowered in your education around Alzheimer's disease, as well as talking to your um, doctors and what you need to say. 
So what matters? These are, these are things that I listed here um, that most of us have heard probably or experienced in your own life living or knowing someone with Alzheimer's disease is what matters to people most. And it's, it's really clear that um, people want to maintain as much independence as possible. Um, they want to stay as engaged as possible, ability to do what they love, maintain dignity. That's a huge one that I hear a lot from care partners, as well as minimizing the burden on their families. Like uh, many of you are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And what, what is it that you as a care partner need to understand? And we want to understand those questions here at UVA as well. Also planning for the future as well as maximizing quality time. I hope I didn't skip over safety is a number one thing that as people progress with Alzheimer's disease, we need to think about what, how you can make modifications um, to support the person living with um, the disease. I've talked a little bit about this, but one of my goals as a researcher um, in this area is to continue to advocate for more education to families and their loved ones in dementia and Alzheimer's disease. I support training more healthcare providers. We need more. I mean, it takes a long time to get in to see a neurologist um, for a full assessment. So we need more um, partnerships with our um, rural healthcare practitioners because again, they may not have specialists in those areas. So we need to take our, our experts to those communities and help them to build more um, comprehensive neurological programs. And these are just a few strategies and a reminder to always include the care partner or caregivers into these conversations. And please, if you're, you're part of those families, start the conversations early, even in the early stages of before people start to show memory decline about how you want your family to be involved in your care. Um, and finally, I've mentioned this, have um, conversations and partnerships that support inclusive communities where no one is left out, uh, because the more we provide for all, everyone is um, supported. So what to expect in the long run? These are things that I think are important for you to have conversations with your healthcare team. But you, everyone should have a relationship with a clinician that they trust, someone to ask what's normal and what's not. These are not, um, it's, it's, I do a lot of webinars with um, family caregivers and I say, these are questions that you should always ask. And people are like, no, I can't ask my doctor a question. They might think that I, I'm not clear what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, but this is what they want to hear. They need to hear what you need, what you have questions about. And so we try to give um, care partners and their caregivers just the tools that they need to make sure that they're getting the um, answers on how to best live with someone with dementia as well as provide care for them over the, the progression. Always um, try to find someone who is clear or when, when to be concerned and when not to be. So you'll hear in some of the later talks some of the symptoms of what's normal and what's not and when you should take someone to um, see someone as a specialist. Someone to guide you when the course gets rocky um, and when you're not sure. We partner in our team um, at UVA. We have a multi-interdisciplinary team where we include social workers um, in that process to help families also talk through some of the strategies and additional resources they might need. And then, of course, someone to partner in your care. So now I'm going to shift and turn it over to Dr. Bloom, and he's going to talk more about the biology of aging. Thank you very much, uh, Ishan, and thank, thank you everyone in the audience for taking the time to come out here on a beautiful Saturday morning to hear all about Alzheimer's disease. So what I would like to accomplish uh, this morning uh, is to give you a bird's eye view of what's going on under the hood, what's happening inside the brain uh, that causes the, uh, the gradual but never-ending uh, loss of ability to make new memories, to recall old memories, and, and basically to analyze any kind of information. Uh, I then will conclude by giving you uh, a sort of status report on where we are clinically, what's being done in terms of trying to diagnose Alzheimer's disease very early, uh, and then to intervene in a way that will either prevent uh, or delay the onset of symptoms and slow the progression of those symptoms. And you'll notice I didn't say cure because uh, I think prevention looks a lot more uh, promising than actually reversing the symptoms uh, once they become entrenched. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is arguably the most urgent medical issue uh, on the planet. 
According to the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, just about 10 years ago, Alzheimer's disease became the most expensive disease in the U.S., exceeding even cancer and heart disease for the annual cost to American society. So for example, last year, the total cost for Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. was about $320 billion. And unless we can make some advances in uh, treatment and prevention, uh, Pretty soon, by the middle of the century, 2050, the annual cost will be about $1.9 trillion, and that's in 2022 dollars, 2022 dollars, without even taking into account inflation. Right now, about 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease, uh, and that number will uh, roughly double by the middle of the century, unless we can do better than we are able to do right now. Um, as you heard from Ishan, the uh, greatest risk factor is age. Uh, there are a bunch of other risk factors. One uh, that's also worth mentioning is, is, is head injuries. So uh, try to protect your head, and that will, that will help not only for Alzheimer's disease, but for a number of other neuro, uh, neurodegenerative diseases that can be uh, provoked by uh, head injuries, even individual head, head injuries, let alone uh, multiple head injuries. So, uh, ever since human beings have been walking on planet Earth, uh, at least some of them probably had what we now call Alzheimer's disease. But it wasn't formally described until 1906 by a German psychiatrist, Alois Alzheimer, uh, as a result of uh, treating the woman you, whose picture you see here, August Dieter, uh, who died a few years after she began uh, seeing Dr. Alzheimer. And what he did was something that nobody had ever done before, which was uh, following her autopsy, uh, he took thin slices of her brain and stained them with, with what at the time were, were new tissue staining methods that revealed the two things that you see highlighted here on this slide, uh, amyloid plaques, which are made out of a small protein called amyloid beta or A beta, and neurofibrillary tangles, uh, which are made from a protein called tau. Now, he knew that this was not normal because he examined uh, brains from people who were not showing signs of dementia, and he never saw any of these structures in those brains. So he inferred that somehow the plaques and the tangles were related to the mental condition that uh, uh, August Dieter had. So, if you look at the plaques and tangles under an electron microscope, they look pretty similar. They look like bundles of filaments that are uh, pretty similar in size to each other, uh, even though they're made from completely different materials. So the, prim the primary uh, characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, besides the well-known cognitive decline, is the presence of plaques and tangles. And this all sort of begs the question of, well, what is it that causes the memory and cognitive loss in Alzheimer's disease? So to answer that question, going a little bit too fast here, we first have to uh, consider, well, what are, the, what are the basic building blocks of memory and cognition? And they're what we call synapses, connections that are made between neurons. And what you're looking at here is actually a picture from uh, what at the time was a living rat. Uh, you see two neurons and, and uh, encircled uh, uh, with that uh, pur purple or pink circle uh, shows a synapse, a connection between these two neurons in the rat brain. And that is the, uh, the these synapses are the, the neuroanatomical basis of learning, memory, and cognition. So here you're looking at one synapse. What's going on in the human brain? Well, we have a neural network that is made up of about 86 billion neurons, uh, which on average make about 1,000 to 10,000 synapses each, which translates into somewhere between 86 and 860 trillion synapses all arranged in a very intricate way with what we call a neural network that's somewhat analogous to the, uh, the, the CPU, the chip that runs the computer that is showing this uh, uh, 
presentation right now and the cell phones that you're all carrying and all sorts of other things. But of course, on a far more sophisticated level. So with all of this in mind, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are caused quite simply by two things. The, the gradual uh, failure and eventual loss of synapses that are involved in controlling memory and cognition and the death of the neurons that make those synapses. And at the end of a typical course of Alzheimer's disease, the patient may have lost as many as 30% of the neurons in the frontal lobes of the brain. And as you can see here in this picture, uh, that translates into uh, a loss of substantial volume, about a third of the volume of the brain because of the loss of all of these neurons. So what is it that causes synapses to fail and neurons to die. And that brings us back to plaques and tangles and the filaments that, that, that form them. And of course, they don't just appear out of the clear blue sky. They actually represent uh, the end product of, a, uh, of an assembly process where little building blocks start aggregating with one another and eventually form the filaments that you, uh, that you see in the plaques and tangles. And the, the smallest building blocks are individual molecules, or monomers, as shown here, of amyloid beta and tau. And they initially form small aggregates, just anywhere from two to maybe 20 or 30 molecules that, that are kind of, of uh, they don't really have uh, any characteristic morphology, uh, and we call those oligomers. But as they add more and more subunits, they gradually take on the shape of filaments, uh, and that's what you see in the plaques and tangles. And now, until about 20 years ago, the prevailing wisdom was that the plaques and tangles are not only signs of a diseased brain, but are somehow responsible for the symptoms, for the loss of synapses and the death of neurons. Well, there's now a preponderance of evidence that says it's actually the oligomers, the smaller aggregates of amyloid beta and tau, they're floating around in the brain and spreading from neuron to neuron and are compromising synapses, destroying synapses, and eventually, just about the time that the plaques start forming and a little while after that, the tangles, that's when the neurons actually start dying. So why is Alzheimer's disease so challenging? Here we are in 2023. We've all witnessed many medical miracles in our lives. Uh, most recently, uh, the appearance of a brand new disease, COVID, followed within a year or uh, by uh, very effective vaccines that played a tremendous role in, in mitigating the uh, effects of the disease. But we still can't do much better for Alzheimer's disease right now than we could five years ago or 10 years ago or even 50 years ago. And this is because it is now understood that Alzheimer's disease doesn't begin when symptoms are evident, but rather, on average, probably about 25 years earlier, when these small aggregates, oligomers of amyloid and tau, which, by the way, work together, they work coordinately, uh, are gradually compromising synapses, destroying synapses, and then eventually killing the neurons that make the synapses uh, that uh, uh, mediate memory and cognition. And those neurons cannot be replaced. When they're lost, they're gone forever. So um, this, uh, this means that we really have to have a strategy that's focused on uh, prevention and early diagnosis. Now, to enlist in an Alzheimer's drug trial, traditionally, and even pretty much to this day, a patient must usually have a diagnosis of what's called mild cognitive impairment, uh, uh, which is exactly what it means. And it usually, but not always, is a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. It could be a precursor to some other disease or just a temporary condition, or uh, a, a Alternatively, a diagnosis of early Alzheimer's disease. That's what it takes in most cases to enter a drug trial. But in light of what I just told you, that's kind of like trying to stop a train wreck by applying the brakes five seconds before impact. 
Now, this is a little dramatic, I, I, I admit, but the, point, but the point of the matter is that the key is going to be early diagnosis combined with uh, effective intervention, and I list here disease-modifying drugs, drugs that actually alter the course of the disease as opposed to just uh, mask the symptoms temporarily. Uh, and, but I, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to exclude the importance of lifestyle adjustments, some of which you heard about from Ishan. They can be very important also. So what does the drug landscape for Alzheimer's disease look like? Well, until about two and a half years ago, this is it. Four drugs, uh, the cholinesterase inhibitors and this, uh, the, the, this other drug, Memantin, that you see. Uh, they were the only four that were approved by the FDA, and those approvals came uh, between 1996 and 2003, uh, and then there is a combination of memantin and denepazil, which uh, was approved as, as a combination of, uh, a little bit later. Now, uh, until pretty recently, all of these drugs were considered to be Band-Aids, drugs that couldn't really alter the course of the disease, or if so, not very much at all, but were moderately effective for a short period of time uh, at alleviating symptoms. Uh, there's now some evidence, uh, mainly based on research from my lab, that memantin, one of these drugs that was not been considered to be disease-modifying, may actually have potent disease-modifying properties. Uh, it's never, it's used uh, officially only for treating moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, uh, but it's never been tested in the context of prevention. And in fact, uh, we now have a small pilot phase two clinical trial uh, for uh, memantin as a prophylactic, as a prevention for Alzheimer's disease, uh, being conducted at UVA under Dr. Manning's uh, direction. Uh, well, the drug landscape changed pretty dramatically about two and a half years ago when the FDA approved this monoclonal antibody called Agihelm, uh, which is delivered by injection uh, through the circulation every couple of weeks. Um, and uh, there was a lot of fanfare about the approval of Agihelm, as well as a tremendous amount of co controversy. And that's because the efficacy of Agihelm uh, the evidence for its efficacy is very weak, and uh, the FDA approved uh, Aduhelm because it was very effective at getting rid of amyloid plaques, which led the FDA to conclude that, that there is an expectation that plaque loss will eventually lead to cognitive improvement, or at least uh, slowing the rate of cognitive decline. Uh, so this is all based on expectation, and I would, I would say that, well, for, for two reasons. One is economic, and the other is something I'm going to tell you about in the next slide. Uh, very few people are using Agihelm. Just earlier this year, a few months ago, or actually at the beginning of this year, the FDA approved another monoclonal antibody called Lecambi, that's it, or Lecanemab is the generic, the, the trade name is is. Lakembi, interestingly made by the same two companies that collaborated to produce Agihelm, that's Biogen from uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and ASI, which is a Japanese company. It's a very similar product, but, but the, uh, uh, the clinical trials indicate that this one seems to work quite a bit better. Now, it's still only been, and it's still only been tested uh, in patients that have mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's disease. And that's because of the expense of running trials with patients who uh, uh, may not be symptomatic yet but are on the road, uh, those trials are very long, very expensive, and I think we're just going to have to all be patient to see just how effective Lakembi is. And there are some other drugs uh, like it that are probably going to be improved by the FDA pretty soon, including another antibody called uh, denanumab made by Eli Lilly and company. So the big questions are, how can we identify people who are at risk long before symptoms arise? And once we're able to do that, what can we do to prevent or delay symptom onset or at least slow symptom progression? And, uh, there's really been tremendous advances in the last half dozen years or so 
in early detection. And uh, what you're looking at right now is really one of the most recent examples of this, uh, a blood test, a simple blood test uh, that can detect a, uh, a chemically modified form of tau. Uh, and depending on how much of that you have in blood, that can be a real indicator of whether you're on the road to Alzheimer's disease, and if so, uh, how long in the future you're likely to be symptomatic. But it gets even better than that. Uh, this is a new blood test made by a, a, a company called C2N, and uh, it uses, not, it, it measures not only this modified form of tau, but also a couple of different variations of amyloid beta. And, and all of those markers together really give uh, a very uh, accurate picture of where anyone is on the road to Alzheimer's disease, if they're actually on the road at all. So um, as far as uh, treatment is, is concerned, I, I think I've told you what's, what's out there. The, the new monoclonal antibodies, another one that's on, uh, that we'll probably see approved early next year. Um, we're very excited here about the possibility that Memantin might uh, uh, have uh, potent disease modifying uh, properties, and we hope to be able to test that uh, more rigorously in, in the future. Uh, and there are lots of other things in the, in the pipeline, but uh, I think I've sort of reached the end of my road, and uh, uh, now I'm going to turn over the mic to, uh, to Dr. Manning. Thank you for your attention. How do I get the slide to progress? Oh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thank you to my colleagues for doing a great job presenting so I get, can come up here and just talk about the easy stuff. Um, uh, I, I will start by, um, I want to say a little bit more about the drugs that uh, George was talking about. So first, the blood test, um, from a clinical perspective, um, both with the, bl the blood test and other biomarkers. Thank you. Um, f first, um, those are used, and I imagine once we start using the blood test, only for people who already have symptoms, because those biomarkers occur in people, one as George was talking about, before they have symptoms, but not everybody is going to get symptoms, so they are better at risk, uh, at, at assessing an increased risk, um, or in people who already have symptoms, they are um, they're good at helping us understand what the etiology or what's causing the symptoms is. Uh, um, so I'm going to start back to you've heard a lot about this um, today. How uh, Alzheimer's disease is increasing everywhere. There is nowhere that is spared. You can see here that in the Americas in 2050, it's projected that there will be 29.9 million people. And if you look at these numbers across the world, um, the differences in numbers are basically based on how old the population is. So where there is a larger population and there are more older people, you're going to see more dementia or more Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease. Uh, bring it, bringing it back home to Virginia, um, in the number of people age 65 or older with Alzheimer's disease in 2018 was um, 150,000, and we project that by 2025 it'll be 190,000. Um, and uh, this leaves a lot of people who need care and for whom we need to provide treatment. We do not have enough trained providers in the Commonwealth of Virginia to care for these people. So when you call the clinic and we can't give you an appointment right away, that's why. So um, please be be aware of that. I, I do want to, um, I know that Althea asked you earlier to raise your hands if you 
uh, knew someone who had Alzheimer's disease or were impacted. That is something that I often ask when I'm teaching a class of undergraduates or even high school students. And the same number of people raise their hands. That is, when I ask undergraduates to raise their hands, the entire class raises their hands because they all know someone who has Alzheimer's disease or are impacted in some way. So I want to talk a little bit about the symptoms of cognitive impairment um, or memory decline. Um, and the first thing I want to say is having Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia is not normal aging. Um, in normal aging, there are some things that occur that um, include forgetting names, for, uh, forgetting proper nouns. That is perfectly normal. It's irritating, but it's normal. Um, but Forgetting um, appointments or recent events. So if you went to a party last week and you have no recollection of it, even after someone reminds you of it, that's not normal. Um, forgetting conversations. Um, you might forget the, the details of a conversation. That can be normal. But forgetting it altogether is less normal. Um, difficulty performing more than one task at a time. And again, that gets harder with age, but the greater the difficulty is, the more out of the range of normal that is. Um, difficulty solving problems or making decisions. So doing something, for example, balancing a checkbook. Um, if someone has been balancing a checkbook all their lives and suddenly they can't do it, um, and by the way, young people don't even know what checkbooks are, so don't ask them to, to uh, balance a checkbook. Um, taking longer to do things that used to take less time. Um, and one of the things that I often ask people is, um, if someone has been cooking dinner, making dinner their entire lives, making recipes that they've loved, and um, they can't uh, put the dinner on the table, the, uh, getting all the dishes together at once anymore, or they can't remember how to make dishes that they've always made, that becomes worrisome. Um, there can also be language problems that are greater than just forgetting the names of people, but actually forgetting how to put sentences together, the grammar becomes incorrect, um, or even speaking fluently. Um, and here, this is a really important one, trouble managing medications. So there are missed doses or overdoses. Um, even as, as people age, there are more and more medications typically that are uh, required. Um, so using a pill box becomes really important, but if the person can no longer fill the, the pill box accurately or uh, remember um, how to take it from a pill box, um, that becomes uh, not only a, a sign that there's something wrong, but also becomes dangerous. So George referred to mild cognitive impairment. Um, mild cognitive impairment is when there is decline from how the person used to perform cognitively previously. Um, it doesn't interfere with day-to-day -day tasks. So day-to-day -day tasks like activities of daily living, including dressing, bathing, um, cooking, those sorts of things. Um, but uh, the reason that mild cognitive impairment is so important is that people with mild cognitive impairment have a significantly increased risk for dementia. So if we are looking for someone who is at heightened risk for dementia, we look for people with mild cognitive impairment. Not everybody with mild cognitive impairment is going to get dementia, but it is a great, uh, much greater risk. Um, now, people often ask, what is dementia? Dementia is actually a dis descriptive term. What it describes is someone who is having trouble with uh, any number of, of cognitive abilities, including memory, language, abstract thinking, including uh, decision making or executive functioning. Um, but dementia doesn't describe what the cause is. It just describes that there is a significant change. Um, and um, dementia typically involves impairment in one or more of those activities of daily living, things that we do, bathing, showering, dressing, um, as I mentioned before. Um, Alzheimer's disease, is, under the big umbrella of dementia, Alzheimer's disease is one of the kinds of dementia. Um, it is the most common form of dementia, and memory decline is the cardinal feature. So in order from a clinical perspective, to have the clinical features of Alzheimer's disease, you must have memory loss, and you must have loss in one other uh, area of cognitive functioning. 
Um, the, the onset is slow and progressive, so people often don't recognize it. And what I, I see a lot in uh, coming from partners or spouses is that they are gradually taking over responsibilities for their partner who has dementia because the changes are so gradual, they may not even recognize that there is a significant change that's occurred. Uh, the course is progressive. Um, the average duration is 15 years. That is a very long time to live uh, with a disease that is disabling and um, very hard if you're living with uh, that person as well because it is such a long uh, course. Um, the disease is, as uh, Sean mentioned, is more common in women than men and that's even controlling for the fact that women live longer than men. Um, as uh, both of them told you, age is the biggest risk factor, and we know that less education is associated with higher risk, but that's a little bit nuanced because um, there's something called cognitive reserve, um, and, and people who have more education tend to have more cognitive reserve. And what that means, uh, what, how we understand that is that um, people with more education have more uh, strategies that they use to prevent uh, the, the cognitive decline from manifesting. Um, and so they're able, they don't get diagnosed or they don't, uh, aren't seen to have the clinical features of cognitive decline until later on. But people with more education or more cognitive reserve, once those strategies they've been using to work around the fact that there is cognitive decline, when those, once those strategies fail, um, it seems like they fall off a cliff in terms of cognition. So the, the diagnosis uh, may be later, but um, it, once the, it's clear that they have cognitive decline, the decline appears to be steeper. Um, so um, you've seen a lot, uh, you've heard a lot about this from my colleagues, um, and I'm just gonna say here that um, it is a serious disease with um, a lot of costs associated both uh, in terms of medical costs and uh, care provision costs. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of people are involved. There typically are 16 um, unpaid caregivers, that is spouses or other family members. There is huge loss of income from them. Uh, from the work that they aren't doing. And really our healthcare system is based on the fact that there are gonna be these unpaid caregivers who are providing the, the largest amount of care for people with dementia. Um, uh, you've heard a, a, about this from George, but the disease, um, we believe that the brain changes in the disease occur well before we see features of the disease. So you can see that um, the, um, the brain changes are occurring when people appear to be normal, um, and by the time they get to that stage that's MCI, mild cognitive impairment, they already have significant pathology associated with the disease. Um, and then, of course, when they have the full-blown dementia, they, um, they have had the brain changes for many years. So if we are going to target people for intervention, um, it needs to be much earlier on or um, we're not gonna have much, much success in stopping the disease. Um, what does Alzheimer's disease look like? Who does it impact? It impacts everyone. It, um, age is the biggest risk factor, as you've heard again and again, but it doesn't matter um, what you look like or where you come from. As Ashan mentioned, um, uh, minoritized people and black and Hispanic people are at greater risk, um, but no one, um, no one can escape for certain. Um, I'm just going to give you an example. I want to talk about how we care for people with Alzheimer's disease in our clinic. Um, here you see a couple. This is uh, a, a woman who is, has just received her diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And of course, it's a really traumatic experience. Uh, what we don't want and what happens too often when people receive a diagnosis is that um, they're given the diagnosis and told, see you later. Um, and they feel like they are alone on a raft somewhere in the middle of the ocean. We do not want that to happen. We want to be clear that when someone is diagnosed, we are there for them um, for the duration. And that we, our goal is to provide a network of care to help people through the journey. Oh, sorry. Hmm. 
Okay. So what happens when you come to UVA? And this should happen anywhere that you uh, get a diagnosis. We do a dementia workup, which includes a neurological exam. You should have cerebral imaging, so neuroimaging uh, and MRI. Um, or a, a PET. Um, so one, we just are looking for structurally, is there anything else that could explain the changes? Um, and one of the things that we see is brain atrophy, that the brain is shrinking. We do not, contrary to what people think from getting an MRI, we don't make a diagnosis from it. It is just one of the pieces. Um, we get um, blood work to rule out other, other things, like is there a B12 deficiency, are they um, hypothyroid. Um, we want to find anything that we can that is, um, we can correct. So if they have B12 deficiency, we want to correct that deficiency. Um, we then do a neuropsychological evaluation, and that's a really important component of this because it lets us know, one, is there um, cognitive change that is greater than what we would anticipate based on the person's age and their edu edu education and their occupation? Um, and we can tell from the pattern of decline um, what that is, um, whether it is consistent with Alzheimer's type dementia or there are lots of other kinds of dementia like vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, things that we, I don't have time to tell you about today, but it is important to understand what the, what the actual diagnosis is. Um, people will uh, say to me, why is it important to get a diagnosis if you don't have a cure? Well, one is it enables us to provide you with the medications that can change the rate of decline. Um, it also is really important in terms of care planning. Um, if, per, if the person has a, a dementia, we want them to be able to partner in their care and to express their wishes um, so that we can honor them. So at UVA, we provide state-of-the-art diagnosis and, importantly, ongoing psychosocial care. We also have um, clinical trials and the newest treatments, and that is, we, George talked about the trial that we're doing. We have other um, trials as well for medications that we think are promising. So the care that we have, one of the things that I think is really important to say is that we believe that who are we are treating or providing care for is not just the patient, but the patient and that caregiver. Or it could be, usually there is one primary caregiver, but we include anybody who is part of the caregiving circle. And what we provide is, um, uh, as Sean mentioned, social work, neurology, neuropsychology. We have a fabulous nurse practitioner. We have a nurse coordinator. We have clinical research. We have physical therapy, occupational therapy. We partner speech and language therapy. Uh, we partner with the Alzheimer's Association. So our goal is to provide complete multidisciplinary care that is wraparound. Not sure why I'm having problems. Can you? Do you mind advancing? Thank you, Althea. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to talk fast. It's not us, it's the technology. All right. So, um, okay. So, I am going to just keep talking here while they try to advance my slides. Um, we follow uh, what is called the biopsychosocial bio model. And you skipped one, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> There you go. Um, so what we provide is on the biological front, we provide medication management, um, which there is a big role for. Um, G George mentioned the medications. The medications at this point are not disease modifying, but what they do is slow the rate of decline. Um, that said, there are behavioral things that, um, so Mediterranean diet, um, staying cognitively active, at, active and physical activity are extremely important, and the three of those things together pr uh, provide uh, the same thing, the, s the same change in rate of decline as do the medications, and we want, every we want to come from all angles. Um, we provide emotional support, and we create a social engagement plan. Next slide, please. We have care coordinators, which have been, we have been able to get through grant funding and through the gracious funding of um, philanthropy. And what our care coordinators do is they provide a home visit um, and they provide at least monthly contact, but ongoing contact with our 
uh, care providers and our pe uh, people with dementia. They provide uh, support for long-term care pl planning. They uh, provide education on financial resources or benefits, behavioral management strategies, um, education around community resources and disease progression, and they provide emotional support. And one of the things um, is this, they will also come to our, uh, the appointments in clinic with the people they are care coordinating for to help um, sort of translate. Sometimes it gets hard when you are in an appointment to take in everything that's going on. So to have someone there who understands the language and understands what's going on with you personally can be really helpful. Next slide, please. Our care, our care coordinators do it, as I said, through home visits, um, helping provide services. They advocate for our uh, patients with dementia and their caregivers. They provide good communication and ongoing assessment. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a picture of that same couple who uh, ho we hope is feeling happier and more at ease because we are not leaving them all on their own, just providing them with a diagnosis and sending them on their ways. Um, the idea is we really um, intend to be there for people with dementia and their families to help them through the disease process. And I think that's it. Um, I just want you to see here. Um, we, here are additional resources. Um, I wanted to mention that the best way to get involved with any kind of research is through um, our, uh, through our Virginia Alzheimer's Disease Center registry. Um, and the best thing to do is to either call Anna Arp, whose name is on there, or to email her. Um, our registry is not just for people who have dementia, but for care partners and anyone who is interested in participation. And getting on our registry just means we will contact you if there is something that we think you would be eligible for or might be interested in. And we, um, you can say no every time, or you can say yes, I'd like to participate. Um, so I think I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much to my colleagues for um, amazing talks. And I think, I mean, it really was the technology. We lost a couple of minutes, but um, we want to take... Take, take, oh, can't hear me. Oh, sorry. I'm loud normally. Um, we have probably time for a couple of questions, and there are two mics on the floor. And as you're thinking of that burning question you want to jump up and, and ask, I want to remind you that we have Ms. Cooper um, in the audience who was featured in the film. So if there are caregivers or care partners in the room that may want to talk to her even after the question and answers are over, she's available to um, give you a little bit of that insight. And we have a question. Yes. Yes, I have a question for uh, Dr. Manning. Uh, I'm a care provider. Um, we're engaged with UVA Health, been very pleased so far. Uh, I'd like to hear more about um, getting on the um, care coordinator. Uh, we're in the registry, but how, how, do, how, do you, how do you engage with the care coordinator? Because we haven't been involved with that, to my knowledge, so, so far. So um, one of the things you can do is email Anna Arp and let her know. Um, we are, we, uh, we at this point ha are gearing up with more care coordinators thanks to increased funding. We have, because I've had to uh, pay for the care coordinators through research, we've had very strict criteria. We are in the process of hiring more care coordinators. So we are, vision is to provide care coordination to every family who comes through. What, uh, I'm glad you're on the registry. Thanks for being on it. If you would email Anna and let her know, um, we will get you on the list for as soon as we can get you a care coordinator, we will. And, and I'll just add to that, both Carol and I sit on the Alzheimer's Disease Research Commission for the state of Virginia, and this is something that we're advocating for our legislators to fund more care coordinators mm -hmm. across the state because the evidence is clear that, that we need more support. So as she said, we've been using funding, but we want it to be a policy um, change across the state because it's so effective. I believe every person with dementia and their caregiver should have a care coordinator. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, um, looking for uh, comments or opinions about the, I, I believe it's called the Bordeson Protocol. Dr. Bloom. No. Yeah, okay, so that's, uh, uh, you're talking about Dale Bredesen and his book or, or a series of books about how you can uh, prevent Alzheimer's disease uh, by diet and lifestyle adjustments alone. Uh, I, I, I th my personal opinion is that uh, 
the advice he's giving is valuable, but highly over exaggerated. Okay, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Wood. I uh, recently retired, and I've been watching TV a lot, and I'm inundated by these Prevazin uh, commercials. And I'm just, I mean, it seems like you take a couple of pills and you do quantum mechanics. I just wonder if you uh, have uh, any thoughts on that. If it works, it's expensive too, as I understand. Yeah. Uh, so can I just say that my father asks me about Prevagen about every three weeks, and <laughs> and I'll tell you the same thing I tell him. Um, there is there has not been a double blind study indicating that it works because of um, so it does not have to. It can advertise. It does not come under the same FD reg, FDA regulations where there has to be a double blind clinical trial. Um, I. I don't think it's going to hurt you. There is no evidence that it is going to help you. Thank you. I think we've yes. got time for one more. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm curious to find out if you're working with uh, people who have been, um, I guess it's maybe they're, they've got the genetic code or some marker that indicates that Alzheimer's runs in the family and whether the um, things that you're uh, presenting today will help to work with those families who have family members, you know, going down generations mm -hmm. who have Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah. I'm take it. Um, okay. So um, that, that is a complicated question because most of the people who have a clear a genetic link, have a younger age of onset, and that is different from what we've been talking about with more sporadic older age of onset. Um, and, um, many of the people we work with who have older age of onset have a strong family history. Having a strong family history increases your risk, but it is not the same as those, that younger onset people. And yes, we work with uh, families where, and we always take into account the, the number of family members and the genetic risk. Um, there is a risk factor called APOE, um, and having an E4 allele is, again, increases the risk significantly, um, but that course of disease is uh, really not different from what we, I mean, that is just a normal part of the sporadic um, Alzheimer's disease that we see in the clinic. So we always consider genetic risk, um, and we work with those families, but they're, um, at this point, f unless it's those younger age of onset families, um, there is nothing in particular that is very different about uh, the treatment that those uh, people um, would, would have or require. We've got time for one more. Any, any takers? There's one back here in oh, the back. I think we have one in the middle uh, here. Yeah. Uh, Stats appear that uh, Alzheimer's is increasing uh, in the world. Uh, is this attributable to uh, just the fact of the of aging uh, population uh, where we live longer, or is it more diagnosis, or is there any indicators out there of chemicals in society that are causing uh, dementia? I'll start. I'll say all of the above, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say all that's of the, the above. Short but ma yeah. ma I'll agree. Mainly, all of the above. Mainly aging. Yeah. At, at least that's yeah. the level of understanding we have right now. And we're just getting better at yeah. science, right? Yeah. I mean, we're just getting better. We're living longer. We have more medical technologies. So we can diagnose a little <clears> bit better. <throat> and so we get clearer about some of those linkages. But, but again, all of those, um, looking more into toxins, chemicals, all of that. Carol, you were going to say. Yeah, I, I agree with, with ex exactly what you've said. And if you live five years longer because you're not dying of something else that previously would have killed you, you are more likely to live into the age range where you go are going to express symptoms of the disease. Yeah. So we want people to live quality lives. Mm -hmm. So that's why we want to start early. Yeah. All right, and thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, if you missed a talk or you want to share one of your favorites, um, we've got um, many of our talks are recorded and posted onto the UVA Lifetime Learning Vodcast Library. So enjoy the game and have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you.